All Things Conceivable, a surrogacy podcast with Nazca Fontes. Welcome to the All Things Conceivable, a surrogacy podcast. You know, in getting ready for today's show, as some of you might know if you're listening to me, that uh, podcasting is a relatively new endeavor. And even though I've been at the helm nearly 25 years of building families, when I reflect on the progress and the reach that we all have today, it's astounding how far we've come. And just to be able to sit here during these times from my kitchen table and reach a huge audience with some content that is just so important and so helpful to many folks out there who are participating in the surrogacy journey. It's really something quite remarkable. You know, when I started Conceivabilities, I often love to tell this story, but there was no internet. There was no podcast. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. Um, There may have been the early, early beginnings of AOL chat rooms, Um, but I really had to reach participants for egg donation and surrogacy and fertility treatments through the good old fashioned way of just finding outlets that were repositories of information. I would often, you know, hang some call to actions or articles in coffee houses or uh, universities or, uh, you know, some folks who often went to infertility seminars. So it was a very sort of Uh, analog way to reach audience members. And nowadays, look how far we've come. So when I sit down and turn on my microphone, it's really an amazing endeavor to be able to participate in. And I'm so happy that you're here. I am really excited today. Uh, I have a wonderful guest. She's a Brooklyn-based relationship expert and has made her rounds on Good Morning America, own the Today Show, The View, People Magazine, Cosmopolitan, Glamour, et cetera, et cetera, just to name a few. Andrea Sirtash has five books, including He's Just Not Your Type, and That's a Good Thing, and Cheat on Your Husband with Your Husband. She also happens to be a huge voice in the infertility community. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of Pregnantish, a community dedicated to helping those who struggle with infertility and all things modern family building, my favorite. And she even has a podcast. Uh, And on top of all of it, she's a mom. Uh, But the journey to motherhood was a long road for Andrea, and she's here to share some of that with us today. There's so much to talk to you about. I don't even know where to start, Andrea, but just thank (laughs) you so much for being our guest. Um, You are quite accomplished, as you know, my intro described, and also your path to parenthood was complex. It was long. It was arduous. And, you know, today we're going to cover so many topics. But first of all, Knowing I want to hear all about it, why are you just so passionate to share your story? Well, thank you, first of all. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you for the really kind introduction. I, You know, I think, like you and so many of us that were touched personally by the experience of modern family building, um, it was easy to spark my passion because I saw how underserved this topic is. Um, this topic that affects so many millions of people uh, touches so many lives. And yet sometimes it's this big dark secret for absolutely no reason, because it's nobody's fault if we need intervention to build our families. And yet um, I was feeling while I was struggling over many, many years, and I'm sure we'll get into that. uh, I was feeling really isolated and like I needed uh, Uh, more content and resources that I couldn't find, which led me to create Pregnantish four years ago. Well, you know, when you, I've I've read a lot about you and your journey. And one of the things that I really picked up on that's so resonant, and that is you often say it's the best club that you don't want to be a member of, right? And so tell me what makes this Mm -hmm. community the best club. You know, I think it's just that pain can definitely um, connect people and this kind of pain when you're struggling, you know, I basically think of it like this. When sex does not make baby, it's not fun. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this painful experience 
um, has been one that nobody really wants to navigate on their own. And when they find like-minded people who understand the challenge and they're not getting the advice that so many well-meaning people give, but who haven't been through it, you know, like just relax and you'll get pregnant when you have medical infertility. When other people understand that it's not that easy, um, there's not a quick fix when you have a medical issue or you need modern family building because uh, of other reasons. Maybe you're in the LGBT world or you're single, whatever the case may be, people's well-meaning advice isn't helpful. And when you find community who understands the pain and the pain point and the process, it, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, you know, I will say that the community has radically changed and you've seen this probably much more than me with right. your work, but uh, it's changed since even I launched Pregnantish four years ago. I started trying to conceive almost a decade ago and there was way less than there is now. Now you can, um, our biggest audience is on Instagram where people can find each other and, you know, through Twitter or Facebook through hashtags, like infertility communities a popular hashtag. So that didn't even exist a decade ago. So that's, it's easier also to find community. You're, you're absolutely right about that. And in terms of it being a club, I mean, once you're in, like once you get to find your tribe and like-minded folks who are going through the pain and the struggle and the complexities, just having that sisterhood is can be a lifesaver, right? It can be a lifesaver for, for those who are going through this. And you're so right too about the arc and the trajectory of the community and its evolution. You know, I've been doing this nearly a quarter century. It's hard to believe, but 25 <laughs> years ago, there was virtually no information. There was maybe mm -hmm. one seminar once a year in person and you had to visit booths and you had to show up in person. And, you know, it was very secretive. Nobody wanted to talk about it. You didn't have like-minded folks out there. And there was this element of, I guess I'd have to say shame or embarrassment, which is a really mm -hmm. tough thing to say outwardly because there should be nothing shameful or embarrassing about needing help, about needing care in your journey to parenthood. And, you know, your journey in particular has been quite a long one. I'd love for you to share with however uh, much you are comfortable sharing about how you started and how you eventually uh, found your way to motherhood. Sure. I've actually found a way to shorten the decade journey. So it, it fits in a podcast segment because I always joke when people say, tell me your journey to parenthood. How long do you have? Um, right, right, so right. The, the, the broad strokes, the shorter story is when I started menstruating around 14 years old, a doctor suspected I had endometriosis. I didn't know what that was. Uh, but, you know, I was put on the pill. I was told that that would help. And I, I remember the doctor saying to me, because the, the, I should say, my periods used to render me helpless. I couldn't go to school. Once I was in the hospital, I was out for weeks. And my mother took me to the doctor to check it out. And when the doctor said, you may have fertility issues later, I was 14. I mean, the last thing I was thinking about was getting pregnant. So I kind of stored that in the back of my head. And then when I married my husband, I told him that maybe on one of our dates or when we first got married, I said, you know, a doctor once told me this. I don't know if it's true. Um, it may take us a year or two to conceive. <laughs> and it, I mean, I laugh at that myself now because it took us eight years before we met my, my daughter. But um, the long story shorter is uh, 18 fertility treatments, uh, eight doctors, um, two uh, miscarriages, major surgery to remove a fibroid tumor, thinking that would help, um, a lot of stops and starts and heartache. And then in year six of trying to conceive, or trying to conceive, I should say, with fertility treatments, because we had tried for a couple of years before we saw RE, a reproductive uh, endocrinologist. Um, in year six, a doctor said to me, I I'd like you to genetically test your embryos. And if, because I suspect you have healthy embryos, and I think it's your uterus that's giving you issues here, because he kept transferring what looked like beautiful embryos. And we knew I had had endo, we knew I had fibroid tumors, we knew I had some issues in my uterus. So we, we sent our embryos away for genetic testing. And once we had healthy embryos, my doctor said, I have good news and bad news. Um, the good news is I think you're going to meet your baby. 
uh, the bad, because you have healthy embryos, the, the not as good news is I don't think you can carry your embryo. And I'd like you to consider gestational surrogacy. I had never heard of that. I didn't, like I'm sure some of your listeners or people that approach you at your, you know, uh, company, I knew very little about surrogacy. Um, to me, surrogacy, first of all, wasn't ever with your own embryo. It was, I don't know, it was a big mystery to me. So I started researching. I kind of had Google on my side. This was only a few years ago. Um, and I realized, wow, it's really helped a lot of people build a family. And in a way, it was a relief because I was, my body after seven years or six or seven years of fertility treatments was, I was tired. I, I had taken thousands of shots in my belly and my backside. And I was okay and kind of relieved to think about not trying again. Um, but the whole process of finding a gestational carrier was its own crazy chapter. Uh, we had two surrogates drop out on us. We worked with an agency not as good as yours. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I won't name it, but let's just say the agency matters a lot. And I, um, you know, they, they matched us with people who just were not appropriate. And yeah, um, in yeah. Jan January 20, you understand that. And then in January 2018, my first cousin, Alana, um, emailed me, how are you doing? Happy New Year. And I said, I'm, I really, I can't get out of bed. My last uh, surrogate dropped out on me. We've already paid, at that point, we had done all the legal, medical, the workup, the transfer was about to happen and she ghosted me. By the way, I've never heard from her again. I still don't know what happened. Ugh, um, yeah. So it I happens. was left at the altar, it happens. And I was left cold and I said, I can't get out of bed and my husband can't get out of bed. And she texted me that night and she said, have you ever thought of a family member to carry for you? And I was shaking so much that I could barely respond. Um, and the rest is history. I mean, she stepped up, she carried our embryo, which had been created in 2016, tested in 2017, transferred to her in April, 2018. And we met our baby at the end of December, 2018, finally. So, so there's so still much long. there. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the truncated version. So thank you for sharing that. And there, there sure. really is. I mean, there's the, the battle scars, right, of the, the fertility journey. You know, you mentioned, um, I've heard you mention that infertility, as our listeners well know, can be an emotional, relational, physical, financial, and even a spiritual journey, right? And you, mm -hmm. you ran the gamut with all of that. Um, before we get to the surrogacy journey in particular, though, knowing that you went through this process um, and, and you're very successful and you are, are a relationship expert and you had a husband on the side and you had a career, how did you balance this? How did you I get out of bed every day I... and put one foot in front of the other? <laughs> I didn't. If you asked me then, I wasn't as together as I may have seemed to the outside world. Actually, when I came out um, to, on Facebook saying I was infertile and I was launching Pregnantish, the last line of my Facebook post was, so don't judge a Facebook by its cover. Because people had seen me on TV. I'd hosted television shows. I'd gone on book tours, struggling, crying behind the scenes uh, many times. So I wasn't always keeping it together. I also am married to a public school teacher. Uh, your listeners may or may not know that media doesn't pay very well. Um, I mean, I was, you know, on TV and writing books and it's not the most lucrative career, although it's glamorous. So we were also struggling financially to keep up with all these demands. Thankfully, we had good insurance coverage uh, as my husband works for the New York School Board. I had a free cycle in Canada, you know, under 43 years old. That, that's mandated, which is great in Ontario. But for the most part, um, I, I should have had like a credit card with, with air miles during this. It should have been mm -hmm. IVF mm -hmm. miles. I would have um, had many trips. Um, I just think basically you, you just put one foot in front of the other in real time, not really overthinking it because the goal, and I say this to our readers and listeners at Pregnantish all the time, the stakes are so high with this topic. We're talking about literal life. I mean, we're not talking about a, a, another goal that may or may not be big stakes. And 
I, for that, I think a lot of us go a distance we never expect because it so deeply aligns with our values and our sense of who we are and what we want. Um, and, and, I, and I often say to our audience, you've already shown you're going to be a great parent by the dedication you've put into trying to become a parent. I mean, you're doing this for someone you haven't even met yet. I can only imagine the love, attention, and dedication you will have once this being is here. Uh, and I think that's very true for this community. Andrea, let's talk a little bit about your husband. You mentioned you know, his role on the periphery, but how did infertility affect your relationship, particularly you being you know, a, 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 an expert? I, we weren't always on the same page. I tried to take my own advice as a relationship writer. And, you know, I think in many ways, Pregnantish is a relationship site to help people with these chapters. I, but for the most part, I think the key to healthy relationships is being direct with respect and keeping communication open, which we tried to do. We were not always aligned. There were times that he felt that he was done. Uh, there were times I felt I was done. I often tell couples after hard news on this journey, like for instance, a failed IVF transfer, don't decide your next step in that moment. You're not thinking clearly. You need to literally take a moment, grieve, connect with each other, communicate, and then you'll figure out where you're at. So I think we tried to make too many decisions in moments of stress and distress. Um, and we, we, we a few times sought out therapy. Uh, I was worried about him. As you know, men aren't as supported often in this mm -hmm. journey mm -hmm. or, or they don't have as many outlets. So I, it was really important to me to try to find him support, to encourage him to find trusted friends or community members that he could share with. He's not on Instagram looking for hashtags. Um, <laughs> so I just felt like that was important. And, you know, and, and people process, we all know this, grief very differently. And that's okay. There were times he was angry. There were times he was sad. Uh, when I was the cheerleader, we took turns. Uh, there were times he picked me up. And I think that's also good practice for parenthood. You're not always both driving the car forward, you know, like one time someone has to nap or, you know, someone else has to take over the wheel when you're getting tired. And that's just how relationships ebb and, ebb and flow. I, I had more challenges with certain friends, uh, not too many. Most people were compassionate. But there were a few people in the family or friends who gave that kind of glib advice. And as well-meaning as I believe they were, it was so hurtful that it made me distance myself just as a matter of self-protection. And I think that's really common. It, it is very common, um, you know, to the point that people can be very well-intentioned, but they just, they lack the navigation skills in this field, right? It's, and, and they often don't know what to say. And, um, those well-intentioned phrases can oftentimes just make it worse. So I do see that a lot, this self-preservation mode of just stepping back from friends and family. Um, but you know, to isolate can also be a, a challenge too, right? You have to really balance all of it very carefully. You know, tell me about the moment when, you know, you, you, you shared your fertility journey in a nutshell and the point where you realize with um, in concert with your physician that it was the carrying that was the real issue that you had, you know, beautiful embryos that you and your husband created, but it was the implantation and the carrying of the pregnancy that proved challenging. So tell me about that moment when you and your husband, you know, settled on surrogacy as the next step forward. You know, did, what were the conversations about when you weighed the pros and cons of that process? Yes. Well, the, the pros were definitely that the doctor believed I had a very strong chance of meeting the baby finally. Uh, the other pros were giving my body a break again, you know, just uh, not wanting to. I was terrified to transfer another embryo. I had done that many, many times. So that, that, there was a relief factor. The fears I had and my husband had were the cost was extremely prohibitive for us. I, I don't understand why insurance in many places doesn't consider it a me medical necessity. 
Um, we also learned that in New York, where we live, and at the time, by the way, I've been to Albany to lobby for gestational surrogacy to become legal, you know, to compensate surrogates. I was one of the people with Resolve lobbying on, on Capitol Hill every year for these, yeah, for these <laughs> benefits. So I definitely uh, believe in that. But at that time, in 2017, I was also told well, guess what? You can't find a carrier in your state, which which was like a what WTF moment. I mean, what are you talking about? Mind. Um, and I saw yeah. how our mind blowing. I saw how archaic uh, the ver the definition of gestational surrogacy was in, in these debates. I actually wrote an open letter to Gloria Steinem, who was always an icon to me, but who was also protesting gestational surrogacy. I wrote a, a letter which we published on Pregnantish. Uh, to her. <laughs> I don't know that she read it. But the point is that I've done, I've used my voice very much to try to move us into the 21st century on this topic. I, I basically was, was also overwhelmed by who would carry, how would we find that person? When we had initial consultations, you know, I was running pregnant-ish, so a lot of agencies reached out to me, we'll help and what can we do? And that was lovely. But again, cost was a a big issue. I mean, we still have an embryo that's healthy, frozen, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, the whole the whole process. I can't even imagine uh, where we start again. Um, but I believe in it, obviously. So, I I think uh, even writing the application, you you guys know this deeply about all the questions you're asked. I felt uh, I was a bit triggered, to be honest, by the questions around why I kind of deserve to be a parent. It wasn't framed that way, but that's how we were reading it with our sad infertility lens, you know? Um, and it, it felt very um, nerve wracking to present our best selves to hopefully be picked. And um, I remember saying to my husband, you don't look happy in this photo. We're never gonna get chosen. They're not gonna think you're friendly and nice. And he said, this is nuts. I want to like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I think these kind of conversations uh, are, are normal. I'm also Jewish. And I remember one of the questions was, what's your favorite holiday? And my husband said Passover. And I said, oh, you can't say Passover. What if the carrier does is anti-Semitic or doesn't like like you can't say that we we right, can't right. say there, that and there's no and there's no ballast for you to know there, if you, nothing you know, we don't being... know who's reading it and he <laughs> right, said right. i don't want a racist carrying our baby i mean <laughs> we had these crazy conversations i remember my friend who's gay we were talking about it he needs a carrier too and he didn't want a homophobic you know uh, surrogate, like you, a lot races through your mind when you're it, it does. trying to be and, and selected. there's very little for a frame of reference, <laughs> right? There's no frame of reference yes, for this. Yes. No, no. So we, we were just going in blind and, um, and we were chosen, you know, twice and both people left us, not for reasons I later heard that were hopefully because of who we are, but their own personal situation, which is why I don't think they were screened appropriately. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, the, uh, overall, the way I see gestational surrogacy is it's it, the pro way outweighs the con, but it's not a just stop. Uh, you know, a lot of people say just get a surrogate as if um, you just you want it and it boom, it's there. Well, just build a rocket ship to the moon yeah. and I'll see you when you exactly. return. Exactly. Right? Like that. <laughs> It's, it's, um, it's said a, a thousand times by people and that's exactly it. Yeah. It tr true. If they only could peek under the hood in advance mm -hmm. and understand the complexity and even those who go through and have a, you know, what I find is those who go through a journey and it's un for all intents and purposes, very seamless and with a beautiful, happy ending. Mm -hmm. I just think, boy, you're so lucky. And this comes from me, so right? Who, who puts in everything to make sure that, that a program is as foolproof as possible, but there's only so much you can do. It's never foolproof. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a lot of choppy waters to navigate, but you, you know, you mm -hmm. well, hit the jackpot because you had a family member that emerged and tell me about that. Like you, you, you touched upon it when she first reached out and you were shaking and you know, in the moment it was probably so overwhelming, but tell me about those conversations you had prior to both of you saying, yeah, okay, I think we can do this. 
Well, so Alana is my, oh, how, how do I say this in a nutshell? She's kind of my twin cousin. I, for years, people, she's younger than me by a little bit, but people used to say to me um, when she was born, especially, she's a mini you. I mean, she's blonde, but we look alike and I'm brunette, but we look alike and our personalities are similar. And so we were always compared to each other and we always had a, a bond. Now, strangely, we're both from Toronto, Canada, and strangely, we both live in the United States in neighboring states. She lives in New Jersey where surrogacy is and was legal. Mm -hmm. I live in New York. So the stars aligned in, in a very beautiful way at the end of this struggle. But um, she, she had, I think in year five, she had been following along her journey, not just uh, through me and what my husband and I were reporting to her, but through my mom, she's close with my parents. She'd ask them, they'd kind of tell her what was going on. And I think in about year four or five, she sent me an email. I know you don't know why you have infertility. If it's an egg issue, I talked about it with my husband. I will donate my eggs uh, if you want, which was I mean, I couldn't even believe it when I read that. And at that time I said, you know, that is beyond generous. I don't know that that's what we need. I'm still producing a lot of eggs and I'm told my embryos look really good, but I never forgot that she said that. Uh, she didn't offer to carry and I never talked about it with her again. Actually, it's not true. I think a year before we, we, we genetically tested the embryos, I said, I don't know that I need your eggs, but I've just gone through another failed transfer. In case, in case, would you do that again? And she was pregnant at that time. And so, you know, she couldn't actually do that anymore. And I said, no problem, I understand. So I think she had had a much more of a process than I was privy to, to before she texted me, have you thought of a family member? She had, she's re religious, modern Orthodox Jewish. She had spoken to a rabbi. She had spoken to her husband, her community, her family, her grandmother. I mean, she really put a lot of thought into it before asking me if I've thought of a family member. For me, it came out of the blue. For her, it didn't. She said she had been thinking about it for years. And she genuinely felt a call to action. Today, if you talk to her, she cannot believe she did it. <laughs> She said she doesn't regret it at all, but she can't believe she did it. So it was very out of body, excuse the pun, for me and for her. Uh, well, what's, what's and so it was very much, it surprised us. Yeah. Well, what's so interesting is that you tell a tale that's so similar amongst surrogates. Before they ever make the overture to either apply or reach out to a family member, they have done exhaustive research. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is probably news to you, but through this experience, you know it to be true, right? They, they, they will certainly not endeavor to be a surrogate without dotting the I's and crossing the T's within their own community first, you know, because they really do need that support. And so thinking about support, when, when you and Alana finally made this decision after you know, probably some pretty interesting and deep conversations, not just with each other, but probably with your respective spouses, then you had to share it with your family. What mm -hmm. was that like? That was dramatic at times. Um, I mean, most of the family were so supportive. They, they had seen what I had gone through with my husband. But of course they had concerns and expressed them. We, we assured them that the lawyers would draft very intricate, uh, you know, documentation. We'd have therapy. We, we were going through it so consciously with our eyes wide open that no one was going to pull a fast one. <laughs> there wasn't going to be something that uh, shocked either of us. I, I would say, you know, the thing that Alana did not expect as a carrier was the IVF uh, shots for progesterone because she had had two successful pregnancies at that time. She had carried well, she enjoyed being pregnant. You probably hear that with many of the surrogates you've worked with. Um, mm -hmm. And yes. for her pregnancy was, it wasn't um, fun all the time, but it was, it was an experience she enjoyed. And what she hadn't experienced was preparing the body for implantation 
and then supporting the pregnancy in those initial weeks. Uh, the IVF shots were something I had done for seven years at that point. So I was more uh, familiar and trying to support her through that. But I know that was hard for her at the beginning. And I'm so, so proud of her for sticking through it and doing it with a big smile. Uh, she didn't complain to me, even when she asked questions, even though I know she wanted to. <laughs> right, right. So that, w that was something that was a surprise to her, but not necessarily a misconception. Were there any, um, you know, misconceptions that when you shared with your family and friends that they, these surfaced and you had to kind of debunk or dispel any, any myths? Oh, I mean, where do we begin? Uh, yes, there were M a maybe lot of the juiciest one or two. We'll, <laughs> <laughs> well, I love, I love those who say, oh, sh the baby doesn't look like you, Alana. Um, that's a funny one because it's not, I mean, we're first cousins, but my baby should look like her only in that respect. <laughs> um, so that was one, um, a lot of times the medical care, medical personnel didn't know how to talk to us. Now, in a way, I don't blame them. We, we delivered at Englewood Hospital. I think it was their first surrogacy birth, literally. I think people think surrogacy is way more common also. <laughs> so they didn't know, they didn't understand all the nuances. A lot of times when we were monitored, people would call uh, Alana's, you know, whatever they were monitoring, they'd call it her baby. Your baby this, your baby that. And Alana's so thoughtful, she would correct them. Yeah, that's my cousin Andrea's baby. I'm the gestational carrier. So there was a lot of moments like that through the pregnancy. I think an undertold story for intended parents is as grateful as we are, as in awe as we are of our carriers and um, forever grateful. There, you're left out sometimes. You, you don't realize how everyone's congratulating and in awe of your carrier as they should be as they should be. But this was also our moment after eight years. Uh, you know, it was our baby coming and um, I wasn't carrying this embryo, but I certainly went through thousands of shots to create her. And I, I felt a little left out sometimes through no fault of anybody to kind of remind them, yeah, we're the expected parents over here, even though you can't see it because my belly isn't pregnant. Uh, that, that was at, at times a, a bit painful. Sure. And I mean, you speak to something that's really interesting that folks often don't think about. And that is, you know, there, there's so much joy, right, surrounding this. You finally are, are just about to, you know, get that ball over the finish line. But, you know, along the way, there can be obstacles and setbacks, too. And when you're sort of pregnant by proxy through a surrogate, you don't realize mm -hmm. or folks external to the process don't realize that while you share in lots of triumphs, there's also shared grief when things don't work out mm -hmm. the way they should. And sometimes folks, either they put the, you know, the joy on the surrogate and the grief on the intended parents or vice versa. But, you know, there mm -hmm. can be examples where pregnancies, um, they fail, right? There's miscarriages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. now there's four parties grieving a very private moment. And folks forget that, you know, surrogates have to navigate those emotional waters too. 100%. We just talked about that actually on the Pregnantish podcast, which I host. Uh, we did one with uh, f uh, for Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Month on miscarriage with Dr. Jessica Zucker. And we were talking about when surrogates miscarry and how that's an undertold chapter. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you brought that up because I think people don't, it, it's, as you said, shared triumphs and sh shared grief. And by the way, with grieving, as we said before, each person might grieve totally differently and that's not Absolutely. wrong. So Absolutely. someone might, you know, try to jump up and go for a jog and go to a party. I mean, in normal non COVID times and just be out there and try to forget about it. And then someone else may not be able to get out of bed and everybody's right in how they grieve. And there could be a lot of judgment when we don't grieve the same way. I, it, that, that's amazing um, that th this kind of conversation can now come out into the open. Um, these points in particular that we're making together are relatively new, right? The more surrogacy is practiced and the more it's normalized, you know, it'll become fairly routine. This, this level of understanding about all the 
the people associated with third party reproduction, right? They're not just vehicles for the intended parents. They're also going through their own independent journey and it can look and feel very different for each individual. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, one thing, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to this relationship piece because you're just so good at it. You know, when you (laughs) were going through this with Alana, were there anything, you know, tell me about, you know, a situation that may have erupted or an obstacle that you had to surmount together where, you know, being very tactful in the relationship was necessary to kind of move the process forward. You know, tell me, tell me how you navigated the relationship together during any bumps. That occurred. Well, we had insurance bumps. By the way, I'm still having calls about this birth two years, almost two years later. Um, and money is an awkward thing. She was so generous the way, you know, she volunteered uncompensated, though we covered some expenses, of course. Um, but money is always an awkward thing to navigate. And I think we both very much uh, respected the fact that this was a huge favor and any medical mess we would find a way to clean up and we would make the calls and she wouldn't have to be on the phone endlessly with insurance when there was confusion because they don't understand surrogacy, uh, all of that. So um, that was one, I think there were times when you know, our partners weren't necessarily on the same page and we, we had to talk through that. But I, she and I were really connected. I, I felt like we were just so on the same page, which was so lucky. I know how lucky that was. I, I don't take that for granted. So it was more the surrounding people that sometimes we were trying to navigate together. How do we deal with that? Yeah, I'll say you, you really, um, boy, all those years of struggle to have something so smooth that brought that baby into your arms is really remarkable. It's a, it's a really special story, I have to say. And we- Thank you. I, 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 will, I will add not to, you know, there's so many layers with every family story, but if you read the People article on me and Alana, the, the deeper layer even is that uh, our dads are Holocaust survivors and my dad was born in hiding. And when Alana offered to carry, we lost a lot of family. My, my dad and her dad lost their grandparents and other family members in Hungary. And when Alana offered, she said, let me try to help rebuild our family. I can do this. I can help. And so it became a really much deeper circle of life story than we ever imagined. But anyway, I, I can't even do it justice. Just like any baby story, even if it's not this complicated, you can never quite do it justice, but I, I'm still in awe of it. Well, you know, you've managed to tell this story so authentically. And, you know, even for me, it, it now sheds a little bit more light on why you were able to do that and be so uh, authentic and um, honest and truthful and open about the story. I think that your family history that led to that moment probably was a motivator for you. Yes, it was. You know, a lot of times people will ask you when you're pers- doing gestational surrogacy. Why do, why is, why do you need your own genetics? <laughs> and by the way, I should say I was open to other forms of third party reproduction or adoption. It's not like it was only my eggs or nothing by any stretch. But once the doctor told me I had healthy embryos, of course I was going to work with my own genetic material. And part of it was this feeling of, we have so little family left on my father's side they were killed, literally. I would like to continue this, this bloodline, like if I can. can. Um, if again, if, if I couldn't, I would have been thrilled to bring a baby into the world regardless, no question. And that baby would have been mine, no question. But that, it did have deeper meaning for me in terms of, uh, you know, that reasoning. For folks who are listening, who are on the cusp or precipice of moving into a surrogacy process or undertaking a surrogacy journey, what would be some piece of, pieces of advice that you'd love to share with them? You know, give, give them some perspective on the things that matter most. I think the biggest advice I would share as someone's embarking on a surrogacy journey is to expect the unexpected. <laughs> um, you have to be somewhat resilient, resourceful, and um, 
you know, you really have to move along with uh, some twists and turns you may not expect. And to know that everybody is working towards the same goal, and that's a beautiful thing. I, I, I'm a big fan of open communication and even when things are uncomfortable, expressing it in the most respectful way will always be better than sweeping it under the rug. And it's how you say things. It's not that you have an issue, it's how you present the issue. So if something is uncomfortable and you bring it to someone's attention, acknowledging what you appreciate about them or how they, they mean well, and then expressing what you need will, will allow the other person to hear you more clearly. These are relationship tactics I talk about all the time in my books and writing. And this is something I tried to apply in the circusy journey. Um, everybody in this process is going through something. They may not be going through it as we've talked about the same way you are. And then, so just uh, keep the lines of communication open. If you have an issue, express it in the most respectful way and you'll be fine. It, it's the most beautiful thing when it works. Well, that leads me right to the, the penultimate question here. <laughs> Please share with us how it felt to finally have your daughter delivered into your arms. Uh, I, you know, I would say I can't remember it. It was so surreal, but I have a video where I'm bawling hysterically that my husband captured, so I've seen it. Uh, the first thing I said to Ariel, my daughter, was, that I felt bad for her. It must be so hard to come out of the womb. I don't remember saying that, but I see myself <laughs> say that on the tape, on the you know phone. Um, so I just was, I was so overjoyed and emotional uh, that it, it is a blur. My cousin, I, I was the first to see Ariel. The, the doctor immediately, we, we had discussed this birth plan prior to the delivery that my, my, my cousin didn't want to actually hold her for very long. She didn't want to breastfeed or produce milk. So she was trying to almost like not, you know, not, and also I think there was self-protection in there a little bit. She didn't want to bond. She knew it was my moment. Uh, and she said that so beautifully, it's your moment. You'll be the first. So they cleaned off the baby, handed Ariel right to me. And it was something, I will never forget. I, I, I just couldn't stop. You know, I was so tired and I, uh, for the first month, I, I just couldn't believe she was here and real. And I, and I launched pregnant ish when I didn't know how my story would end. So I, you know, in a, in an interesting way, I had a whole community following this journey in real time. And I was, wor I was thinking about them in the days after. I didn't want to upset anyone or trigger anyone with pictures of my baby, knowing what mm. they had been through. Right, um, right. But, but I was received with nothing but support and uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, it is a community, Andrew, that really is truly supportive. You know, back to the original points about, you know, the best club that you certainly don't want to be a member of, but, it it truly is a supportive community and people do wish each other well and i i know that folks can sometimes have a bit of you know perhaps it's best coin survivor guilt if you will you know they they finally have um achieved a goal of parenthood and there could be a little bit of sheepishness in sharing it right because nobody wants to make anybody else feel bad they only want to lift each other up so it's it's a very normal sentiment once you finally give birth or, or bring that child home. It's not unusual. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I wrote, I wrote a letter to the community about it also. So I think I wrote that for, I wrote that for what, what to expect. So a different site, but, um, I've often checked in with them about how they're feeling on that. And I don't, on pregnantish, we have a policy to not show pregnant bellies or babies as much as possible. I think it's amazing to me that so many infertility sites and parenting sites focused on infertility show a lot of that. And that can be very triggering to a person who's struggling, even though it's also inspiring at times. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. 
throughout your very long journey and in a space where you get to meet so many people and talk about their experience and all the emotions and and perspectives that they bring to the table, do you have an aha moment that you can share about surrogacy in particular? I think it's amazing that an embryo can be frozen for years and then transferred into another body and create a beautiful life. I think it is a miracle. And I just, um, my aha moment was that I wish I pursued this step earlier, but we only know what we know when we know it. Uh, Before the physician told me about this option or told me about genetic testing, I didn't even know about it. So knowledge is power, um, and uh, my aha moment was this is this is really a wonderful, a wonderful option for someone like me, who was producing embryos with this unexplained aspect of why they weren't, why I either wasn't getting or staying pregnant. That um, that this is this is a beautiful path. Indeed. Andrea, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your story. This was an exciting moment here at All Things Conceivable, a surrogacy podcast. And I know our listeners got a wonderful treat today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy. I'm so happy to share my story and pregnant with all of you. was really a special segment. I was so excited to have an opportunity to talk to Andrea in person and hear her story. And for me, the biggest aha or takeaway moment from this episode was her story when she shared her grandparents' journey through the Holocaust and what the continuation of family truly meant to them. You know, when we meet family members, friends, strangers, and we hear about their infertility struggles and this overarching desire and drive to have a family, that's only the surface. What we often fail to recognize is that there can be a whole history that has led them to this point where having that that continuation of family is absolutely everything but for reasons that we could never possibly imagine. And every person does come to uh, parenthood through their own winding path. For some, it's very easy. Obviously, for some, it's quite challenging. But the dream and the desire is tied together by this drive to have uh, the continuation of something much longer and much deeper than ourselves. So I really thank Andrea for for bringing that story today to the All Things Conceivable podcast and having our listeners understand just a little bit more about the complex road that we all take towards parenthood. We know that support is so important throughout your surrogacy journey. That's why we founded the Surrogacy Learning Center. Our new online community is committed to educating and connecting those in the surrogacy community. I'm excited to invite you to join and connect with experts and people in the surrogacy world. You can sign up at thesurrogacylearningcenter.conceivabilities.com. Thank you, listeners. It was great to have you, and I'll see you next time. Take care. At Conceivabilities, we believe that everyone who wants to become a parent can. Our agency has helped build thousands of families for nearly 25 years. Whether you are an intended parent ready to fulfill your family destiny, a surrogate answering your calling, or an egg donor wanting to expand what's possible in your life, we are your people. See how matching matters. Learn more by joining our Surrogacy Learning Center community at surrogacylearningcenter.conceivabilities.com.